Hi everyone, Luke from Cocos. In the last video, we learned about the last stage of rendering process, template testing and deep testing in testing and blending. Today, in this video, we're going to continue to look at blending testing, as well as the front and back side mentioned in the previous video in the stencil testing section. This is the face rejection part. Face rejection is done at the element assembly stage. In order to reduce the number of elements entering rasterization and speed up the rendering, pro rendering process, let's first understand the contents of the mixed test. Blending is the technique that deals with the transparency of an object. For example, glass windows in real life. We can see through the transparency of an object. Transparent objects are divided into fully transparent, which means that all the colors pass through them and the transparency is zero, and translucent, which means that the colors pass through it partially when the transparency is more than zero. Transparency is determined by the alpha value, which is the A component of the RGBA. When the alpha of an object is 0.5, that means 50% of the object's color comes from itself. 50% comes from the colors and the objects behind it. For more 3D objects, an opaque map is used, so maps with a transparency of 1. This only needs to be detected based on depth to determine which objects is presented in the final clip. Object depth versus depth value in the depth buffer. Comparison tests are performed according to the specified comparison function. Any sort that fails this test is discarded. It is not reasonable to use the depth test rule for transparent objects. Transparent objects can be rendered incorrectly, so we need to tell WebGL how to handle textures with alpha information. That is, the pixels that make up the texture image. The blending test is divided into two steps. One is the transparency test and the other is the transparency blend. As we said in the previous section, transparent objects are divided into fully transparent and semi-transparent. If some images do not need to be translucent, just show part of it depending on the texture color value. There is no in-between case. For example, this picture, you can see that the top part of the image is translucent. In practice, if the translucent texture is not handled, the default color of the texture will be displayed like this. At this point, you can see that there is a large area on the top that shows the white color. This is obvious, not the effect we want. If we want to solve the problem of misrepresentation here so that the transparent information of the stripe is recognized, you just need to define the threshold value. Compare the threshold value with the alpha value of the texture, discard any fragments or pixels within the threshold limit, and GLSL gives us the discard commands. Once called, it ensures that the fragments are not further processed. Next, we create a test object. I've created a quad in advanced here. Then we create the effect you unlit and the material. The material's effect is associated with unlit. Because the default effect is the material unlit without lighting, so I named it that way. The reason I used the 3D object quad at the default effect is because, as I said before, this is a 3D engine. The default effect is for 3D objects. 2D objects need some processing to be used, and the processing part is remembered from the sprite effect before. The depth test is turned off, blending is turned on, and the facet rejection is removed. These settings work on depth stencil state, blend state, rasterize state, respectively. We're going to talk about blending this time, so instead of using 2D object, we're going to be using a 3D object. Next, we set the threshold value, and then handle the transparency information of the stripe. And there are two techniques here. We can first change the uh, default technique. Okay, so first we declare an alpha test macro. In the alpha test macro, we define the alpha test perimeter, or parameter, which is a threshold value of alpha test. Then we handle when the alpha of the texture is less than the alpha test value. Then we discard the fragment, or otherwise we keep it. Then we look at the results of the run. Here we've got an error, and then we look at the reason for the error. It's that the block doesn't have a semicolon. I'm miss missing it here. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and let's try this again. And now there's no problem. And then you can see the white area has become transparent pixels, right? 
Well, because we detected it. Uh, when the transparency of the area is less than the threshold value, we discard the fragment so this side becomes transparent. Let's apply it. And then this is the transparency test. Although it's easy for us to discard fragments, but more often than not, we want to see the effect of the interaction between the objects. It's not possible to just discard the fragments like rendering an opaque object of a fully transparent object. And in cases where it's necessary to render multiple transparency levels at the same time, so we need to enable blending. That's the transparency blending part we'll be talking about next. When blending is enabled, depth writing needs to be turned off. As we know from the previous video, depth detection will replace the corresponding pixels. So it's an A or B operation. And the blending method always follows the equation. Where source color represents a source color vector, this is the color vector from the texture. Destination color is the destination color vector, and this is the color vector currently stored in the color buffer. S factor is the source factor value, specifies the effect of the alpha value of the source color, and the D factor represents the target vector, vector value, specifying the effect of the alpha value of the target color. In the blending, there is a function like the depth test, blend func is the blend function for blending. It takes two parameters. The first parameter, S factor, is the source blend factor. Default value is zero. And the second is the D factor target blend factor, which is defaulted to zero. Let's take a look at this diagram for their test constants. But you can also use the functions like GL blend func separate to set the components of the function as RGB alpha separates. All the above factors are in the range of 0 and 1, and the constants involved are the set by GL blend color. Each component also has a value of 0 and 1. After learning a bit about the transparency blending, then I'll try to do it in Coco's Creator 3.0. I prepared an image with a semi-transparent information in advance. The bottom left corner of the image shows the transparency of each cell of the image. I replaced the Coco's logo image with this one. You will see that the cells with 25% transparency information are completely transparent. This is because the transparency threshold is set too high. Usually I am changing it to 0 0.1 is enough. After changing it, you'll find that another problem. As long as there's a semi-transparent grid area, or the same as the transparency of the opaque grid area, this is because we don't have the blending turned on yet. So next, let's try to turn on the blending and set the blend factor. Here, I chose the source factor blends SRC configured as SRC alpha, which means it uses the source color. And the target factor blend DST is one minus SRC alpha. And it means that it uses the one source color. So here's an example of how it's calculated. Suppose the source code is rows, transparency is 50, and the values are 0 0.9, 0, 0 0.6, and 0 0.5. And the values of the color buffer is green, 0, 1, 0, 1. According to the blend factor we just changed, configured, you can see how it's calculated now as shown on this picture. And finally, you can see a glass-like effect, like the one in the video. You can also try to combine different blending factors to achieve different effects. Of course, we can also modify the way it works. By default, the source and the target are added together in the blending equation. We can also modify the calculation method by using GL blend equation. It takes a parameter mode. The mode parameter can be configured to add, subtract, or vice versa. The detail of the configuration can be found here. After learning about depth and blending tests, we learned that opaque objects will discard fragments based on depth and transparent objects will be blended with the fragments in the color buffer when the blending test is turned on. At this point, if we try to put more objects into the scene, for example, if we try to render a translucent object first, the translucent object is closer to the camera, then render an opaque object. The opaque object is further away from the camera. At this point, a situation may arise. As we can see on this picture, the second window of the right is missing the lower left corner in the area. This seems to be not in harmony with your eyes. At this point, if we think about it, is there a depth test or a depth right for the object that needs to be blended? What should be the rendering order of the transparent and the translucent objects? In fact, the correct way to do this is roughly as follow. First, draw all the opaque objects first, then sort out all the transparent objects, and then the viewer's perspective is used. That is, the distance from the camera is used for sorting. In most cases, the depth test is not turned on. Finally, we draw the transparent objects in order of distance to proximity. In Coco's Creator 3.0, we will also follow this principle. 
But for the second part, I'll highlight most. Uh, the, this is because there are some special cases. For example, two semi-transparent objects with an interpolation effect. The upper part of the object A is closer to the camera, but the bottom half of object B is closer to the camera. They have the X shaped between them, so the lower half of the object A is obscured by the lower half of the object B. The same is true in the upper part of object B, but the camera recognizes the depth of the object, so eventually one object will behave abnormally. This situation can be avoided. Ideally, the engine should be able to do the mesh separation. Then the translucent object will separate, be separated by the depth detection. But it cannot do depth writing, so that fragment is not discarded. But even if you had the ideal, there are some conditions that cannot be met. So we can only try to avoid the situation in the production. The project depends on the circumstances. So next, let's change the cube. This time we observe it again. Here you didn't find anything wrong. Uh, so some of you may have doubts about this area, right? Well, that is why blend there's a blending effect. The bottom and the back of the cube are gone. Uh, this brings up the next part of the explanation, which is face shaving. Since an object is transparent, it means that you can see through it to the scene behind and the structure inside of it but it doesn't seem to be the case. That's because the engine eliminates the rendering of the backside by default. So no matter how we rotate it, we can see the front of the object, but not the back. So we need to turn on both front and back rendering. Here we can set it with cool mode. Cool mode is set in the rasterizing state state. It has three states. One is back to cool, the backside, front to cool, the front side, and one is none. In this default case, it is culling the back side. We choose none mode to not eliminate any face. This time, you can see the back side of the object. At this point, some developers will surely ask, what is the principle of this? In short, the course principle is actually the wrapping order. When we define the vertices of a triangle, remember that we defined a set of vertex indexes data before, right? Well, the vertex index data is actually a set in a specific way. By default, the bottom layer defines the counterclockwise direction as the positive direction. Therefore, the order of the vertex indexes is provided in a counterclockwise manner. And our front data is provided in counterclockwise. And vice versa for the backside is clockwise. If we if we execute the backside of the vertex data provided clockwise, it will not display. If this is set to none, it will not be excluded. So both clockwise and counterclockwise can be rendered. One thing to note here is that whether counterclockwise or clockwise is determined by the order of the provided vertices, not the observer's view. Up to this point, there are eight articles in the Coco Shader Basic Introduction in our forums. So mainly take you, it will mainly take you through some of the shader basics and how to do some basic modifications in Coco's Creator to meet some specific effects. You may not be able to build your own engine, but you can still do some maintenance work. And for those who are interested in shaders, you can also check out more uh, rendering related knowledge from the OpenGL official website. Of course, the basis of the rendering is also irresponsible from transformations, that is the application of the vector and matrices. So if you're interested, you can take a look at 3D math primers for graphics and game development to learn more about the basic mathematics. So that's it for our video tutorial on shaders. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.